few more people joining us and we'll begin in just a minute or two. Thanks for coming out, everybody. All right. Well, thank you again for coming, everybody, and uh, welcome to this evening's installment of the Jewish Pittsburgh History Series presented by the Prayer Practice and Learning Committee here at Road of Shalom Congregation. I'm Drew Greenwald, one of the co-chairs of the Prayer Practice and Learning Committee, and on behalf of me and my fellow co-chair, Bill Klingensmith, welcome to this evening's presentation. Uh, tonight's presentation is entitled Road of Shalom Rabbis, J. Leonard Levy, Pacifist, and it's the fourth installment of the Jewish Pittsburgh History Series. And we hope you'll remain us, uh, join us for our remaining sessions uh, coming up February 16th. Uh, D. Clark will be uh, presenting Road of Shalom Rabbis, Samuel Goldenson, labor activist. On March 16th, uh, Eric Legi, who I saw somewhere on the screen tonight, uh, will present Road of Shalom members prominent in Pittsburgh's early social movement movement, and that's March 16th. April 20th, Bob Rosenthal will be presenting Road of Shalom building uh, construction uses. And on May 18th, uh, Matthew Falcone, Executive Vice President of our board, will be presenting Road of Shalom building, architecture, and art. Uh, we also invite you to fill out the feedback form uh, after tonight's presentation. Uh, and for those of you who filled out the ones from our previous presentations, thank you. We've gotten a lot of great feedback. Uh, so that link is uh, in the email uh, that was sent after you registered. And I believe Olivia will be putting a link in the chat that you can follow to fill out the, the form after tonight's presentation. Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce tonight's speaker, our own Martha Berg. She has been the archivist here at Road of Shalom since 2001. She has degrees in religion, international administration, and library science with a specialization in archives management. She has worked as an archivist for the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra and the Heinz History Center, and is an archives consultant for families and nonprofit organizations. She has published articles on Pittsburgh's Jewish history and on American transcendentalism. And without further ado, I will turn it over to Martha. You're muted, Martha. Thank you. Why can't I never get that? I was just saying it was a great pleasure for me to be joining our other speakers in this series. And it's wonderful to see all of your tiny faces on my Zoom screen. My topic tonight is Rabbi J. Leonard Levy, who was rabbi at Road of Shalom until his death in 1917, beginning in 1901, and specifically his evolution as a pacifist. Some of you may know quite a bit about Rabbi Levy, others may know nothing. So I'll begin with a biographical summary, and then I'll talk about the pre-World War I peace movement in the United States and explore how Rabbi Levy fits into it. We will have time for discussion after my talk and slideshow, and Olivia will manage that part. So if questions and comments occur to you as we go along, please put them into the chat. And now give me just a minute to share my screen. Okay. All right. Joseph Leonard Levy was born in the East End of London, not far from the Tower of London, on November 24th, 1865. In 1862, his father, Solomon Levy, who was a Moyle, had become the reader at Borough Synagogue, which served the Ashkenazi Orthodox community of South London, that is south of the River Thames. This is the congregation in which J. Leonard Levy grew up. He was one of 15 siblings. 
He received his religious education at Jews College, entering the primary department there at age nine and completing the rabbinic curriculum in 1885. Jews College, which continues today as the London School of Jewish Studies, was still quite new at the time. It had opened to students first in 1856. I'd like to read you part of a newspaper account of its opening to give you an idea of its sense of purpose, as I think that the attitude and motivation Levy acquired there explains a lot about his future direction. Quote, with the establishment of this nursery, the emancipation of Ju English Judaism from continental Judaism begins. The community will, in a few years, no longer have occasion to depend for the staff of life upon importation from abroad. The future ministers of the Anglo-Jewish congregations will be men of thorough English feelings and views, as conversant with the classics of their own language as with those of their own sacred tongue as acquainted with modern science as versed in ancient lore. Men in whom the flow of the burning thought will not be impeded by heaviness of tongue and whose ardor of enthusiasm will break forth and rouse and kindle with Shakespearean vigor and Miltonian sweetness." End quote. Rabbi Levy, I think, may have imbibed from Jews College his sense of Anglo-Jewish possibilities in a modern world. He had an excellent secular education as well beginning at University College, which is, was a preparatory school for the University of London, where he received his BA in 1884. He was an exceptional student, winning several awards and scholarships and developing competency in nine ancient and modern languages. Ordained at the age of 20, he was elected rabbi for Bristol Hebrew Congregation, then and now, an Orthodox congregation in this port city of southwestern England. Rabbi Levy was so young that the head rabbi of England had to grant special permission for him to perform weddings and burials because he was below the legal age. While in Bristol, he continued his studies at the university there. In 1888, he married Henrietta Plattenauer, daughter of a prominent family in the congregation. And just for chronological context, the Pittsburgh Platform, which is such an important document in American Reform Judaism, was promulgated here in 1885. At that time, Rabbi Levy was just 20 years old. Levy's ideas were becoming more liberal than those of his congregation, and he was ready to make a change when, in 1889, he was recruited by the Philadelphia rabbi Joseph Krauskopf and Harry Weinstock, a California entrepreneur, to move to Sacramento and become rabbi of B'nai Israel congregation there, it was a reform congregation. There was also a recommendation in favor of Rabbi Levy by his brother, M.S. Levy, also a rabbi who was serving a reform congregation in Oakland, California at the time. He also was educated in London and ordained at an early age. He first served an Orthodox congregation in Melbourne, Australia in the 1870s and ended his rabbinic career as a conservative rabbi at Congregation Beth Israel in San Francisco. Although he recommended Jay Leonard Levy to the Sacramento congregation, his knowledge of his own brother was not based on deep acquaintance since he himself had left London when his little brother was still a child. Rabbi Levy apparently had no problem switching from the orthodoxy of his youth and his first congregation to the reform theology and practice of B'nai Israel. The city of Sacramento was chartered in 1849, and its boomtown atmosphere was owed to the discovery in the same year of gold at nearby Sutter's Mill. Sacramento was made the permanent capital of California in 1879, just 10 years before the Levies arrived there. In 1890, the city had approximately 26,000 inhabitants. B'nai Israel was founded by two merchants who moved to Sacramento in the height of the gold rush. Originally Orthodox, it had changed to reform in the 1870s and it welcomed the vigorous young rabbi with open arms. Rabbi Levy, for his part, served the congregation enthusiastically and let his outgoing personality lead him to many community connections in his new home. He initiated pulpit exchanges with Protestant churches, became involved with early labor organizing and got to know state representatives and other politicians. After four years in Sacramento, Rabbi Levy was again recruited by Rabbi Krauskopf 
this time to be Carl's Cuff's own assistant rabbi at Knesset Israel in Philadelphia, which was then located in a massive brand new building on Broad Street in Center City and is now in the suburb of Elkins Park. K.I. had a long tradition of excellent preaching coupled with philanthropy and social justice activism. Rabbi Krauskopf was often called a radical reformer and he was involved in Philadelphia social issues, politics and philanthropy in addition to preaching and lecturing, not to mention founding the National Farm School to such an extent that he really needed an assistant. The two alternated preaching and lecturing at the synagogue and Rabbi Levy fit right into the K.I. tradition. He became well known for his oratorical gifts. He preached and lectured widely, and he founded the Philadelphia Sterilized Milk and Ice Society and the Home of Delight, a settlement house for disadvantaged children. He served on the boards of many institutions and supported the arts. For example, by personally paying part of the cost to send the aspiring painter, Aaron Henry Gorson to study art in Paris. He later brought Gorson to Pittsburgh and referred well-off friends and congregants to Gorson to have their portraits painted. In Philadelphia, Rabbi Levy met the first of the four U.S. presidents he knew personally. In 1897, he was one of five Philadelphia clergymen who met with President McKinley to discuss an equitable tariff. Though Rabbi Levy was well-loved in Philadelphia, there may have been a slight edge of competition in his dealings with Rabbi Krauskopf. They both had very strong personalities and many talents and were very well known in the community. Whether it was a little bit of competition or just that he wanted to be in charge of his own congregation, Rabbi Levy again was receptive when in 1901 an effort was made, this time by Road of Shalom, to recruit him. Road of Shalom, the oldest congregation in Western Pennsylvania, was at that time fairly small, just around 150 families. And it had had congregational leaders who mostly spoke German as their first language, reflecting the heritage of the founding members. Some of the younger generation were looking to grow the congregation, as we say now. They wanted a modern, dynamic, English-speaking rabbi, a leader for the new century. And they were willing to pay a high salary. Rabbi Levy's starting salary here in 1901 was $7,000, or more than $214,000 in today's dollars. Pittsburgh in 1901 was booming. Its heavy industries spurred further by the formation of the U.S. Steel Corporation in that year, produced between a third and a half of the national steel output, requiring a seemingly endless supply of workers. So immigration and overall population were increasing rapidly. In 1900, our city's population was over 320,000 slightly more by the way than it is today, but way, way under its peak of more than 600,000 in the immediate post-World War II era. In Levy's first year at Road of Shalom, the congregation doubled in membership and the building they had just dedicated in the fall of 1901 downtown was already showing signs of being too small. The board, very pleased with the new rabbi, raised his salary to $8,500 in the spring of 1902. In the next few years, Levy began pulpit exchanges with Christian churches, instituted Sunday lecture services, increased educational offerings at the temple, writing new religious school textbooks when he found the existing ones inadequate, and emphasized Jewish home practices. He also protested Bible reading in the public schools, supported open immigration, fought against corruption in the city government, and began to support government regulation on heavy industry often speaking pointedly in his sermons to congregants who were owners and managers in the very businesses he was criticizing for unfair labor practices. Rabbi Levy remained at Road of Shalom for the rest of his too short life. He was 51 when he died of pneumonia on April 26, 1917. During his rabbinate here, Levy focused a great deal of his attention on the development of Road of Shalom as one of the strongest reform congregations in the country. And then he also used that strength as a base for extensive activism in the wider world. Like many other progressives in the early 20th century, he was eternally optimistic, determined to join with like-minded people of all sorts to solve the problems of the world. Levy shepherded the physical move of the congregation from a back street in downtown Pittsburgh to our current location at the edge of Oakland, the emerging civic center of Pittsburgh. 
Under his direction, the architect Henry Hornbossel, who designed the campus buildings for Andrew Carnegie's Technical Institutes, now CMU, oh, sorry, built a grand sanctuary that originally seated 1,500 people. Soon, even that seemed too small, as Rabbi Levy's sermons and lectures reliably drew capacity audiences. Dr. Levy added quite a feather in Rode of Shalom's cap when he invited President Taft to visit the synagogue. This marked the first time that a sitting U.S. president spoke from the bima of a Jewish congregation on the Jewish Sabbath. Taft was the third of Rabbi Levy's presidential acquaintances, after Teddy Roosevelt and before Wilson. On the national and international stage, Rabbi Levy was active in many causes supported by progressives and liberal Jews. But tonight I'm going to single out one area where few other Jews chose to concentrate their efforts, the peace movement. I want to say a bit about why Rabbi Levy's involvement in peace work interested me in the first place. When I was a student during the years of the Vietnam War, I was involved in the protest movement against the war, and I was very fortunate then to receive some excellent training in nonviolence. This was not any passive pacifism, but engaged nonviolent activism in the tradition of William Lloyd Garrison, Tolstoy, Gandhi, and Martin Luther King Jr., and it had a profound effect on my life. Since we are this week celebrating King's life and work, I'm going to take the time to read you his six principles of nonviolence as they're set out along a wall at the King Center in Atlanta. One, nonviolence is a way of life for courageous people. Two, nonviolence seeks to win friendship and understanding. Three, nonviolence seeks to defeat injustice, not people. Four, Nonviolence holds that suffering can educate and transform. Five, nonviolence chooses love instead of hate. And six, nonviolence believes that the universe is on the side of justice. A second strand of my interest in pacifism is the very strong emphasis that Quakers, the Religious Society of Friends, place on peace as a natural outcome of a religious and spiritual life. Quakers are known for performing alternate service as conscientious objectors during wartime and for working to reduce militarism during peacetime. One version of the Quaker peace testimony that resonates particularly with me is from one of its founders, George Fox, who explaining to authorities why he would not serve in a war, told them that he, quote, lived in virtue of that light and power that took away the occasion for all wars, end quote. Taking away the occasion for all wars is a good way to characterize the efforts of the peace movement that developed in the US during the years leading up to World War I. At that time, there were no existing institutions or mechanisms for resolving international conflicts other than diplomacy or war. Peace workers sought to build the infrastructure through which countries would voluntarily submit to the rule of international law both for averting war and, if that failed, for conducting war according to accepted rules. Though many of these peace workers called themselves pacifists, this was not, for the most part, the absolute no war ever pacifism that we often think about when we hear the word pacifism. Rather, it was a pragmatic movement made up of many strands working at different levels in different countries seeking to build an infrastructure for international cooperation step-by-step step over a long period of time through bilateral agreements, free trade pacts, tariff agreements, arbitration, and international courts. There was not a lot of public support for these proposals. Then, as now, nations were disinclined to give up the least little bit of their sovereignty for the cause of peace. Conventions in The Hague in 1899 and 1907 were the first significant international peace meetings. While they brought together a large number of peace activists with a variety of motivations for their work, and they did succeed in codifying principles for the conduct of war and in passing some treaties, they were unsuccessful in their efforts to create binding permanent international courts for the arbitration of international disputes. Even before World War I broke out in Europe in 1914, there had been efforts in the U.S. to build up military preparedness just in case, and those efforts took up a great deal of political and corporate energy in the three years of uncertainty before the U.S. entered the war in April 1917. 
The pacifists argue that the mere act of building up military weapons and human forces signaled a willingness to use those weapons and forces in acts of war, but their voices were eventually drowned out. As soon as war was declared, the peace organizations and anti-war labor unions, for the most part, either dropped out of sight or dropped their opposition to the war. They supported humanitarian efforts to end war-caused suffering, or they supported the war itself, buying into the myth that it would be, quote unquote, the war to end all wars. So I've given you this quick background on the pre-World War I anti-war movement because well, I don't know about you, but my education didn't cover this type of activism for that period at all. And it's really necessary in order to understand Rabbi Levy's involvement. Yes, back to Rabbi Levy now, and to my interest in how he became a pacifist. I wanted to know how he went from being fervently pro-war when it came to the Spanish-American War in 1898, to being even more fervently anti-war when it came to what we now call World War I. The next few slides are pretty text heavy for which I apologize, but looking closely at text is what I had to do to dig down into this subject. I'll read the short excerpts in case you can't decipher them on your own screen. When the Spanish American War broke out, Levy was the first rabbi to volunteer to be a chaplain. He signed up with Keenan's brigade in Philadelphia. And then while waiting for the brigade to be mustered for training, he went on a cross-country speaking tour to drum up support for the war. A newspaper in Sacramento quoted from one of his speeches, the Spanish flag will not be tolerated on the Western shore of civilization, declared Dr. Levy. America will tell Spain to go back into obscurity. Your cup of iniquity is filled. Your measure of cruelty is long drawn out. Avant lie down in the dust and shrink from the sight of civilized and progressive humanity. Those were the doctor's telling words. That was in June of 1898, two months after the war began and one month before Spain surrendered. Sometime after the end of that very short war, Rabbi Levy's views started to change. If we were talking about any other subject, I might say I'm looking for the smoking gun, but our subject is pacifism, so I can't say that. So instead, I'll just say that I'm looking for how and why his views changed. By November 1914, four months after the assassination of Archduke Francis Ferdinand, in a lecture given at Rota Shalom, Rabbi Levy said, quote, those of us to whom religion is a real concern cannot but be opposed to war. If the United States government had the right to draft me today into an army, I would refuse to serve. If the punishment for refusal would be imprisonment, I would go to prison gladly. If the punishment would be that I would be shot to death, I would gladly prefer that I be shot than that the government should direct me to join in wholesale murder, for that is what I believe war to be. Only when my fellow citizens of this country understand this point of view will the American nation become the leader in world peace, end quote. Quite a change, isn't it? And really quite strong language. As I've tried to work out how that came about, I've read a combination of Levy's lectures and newspaper articles about him, many of which cite whole chunks of his sermons and lectures, especially the early ones that otherwise we might not have at all. Unfortunately, there is no extant collection of Rabbi Levy's personal papers or correspondence that might have given us more clues to his thinking. One thing that was immediately apparent was that from the very first days of his arrival in Sacramento, Levy became a huge American patriot. He started at B'nai Israel in the fall of 1889, and by the time of his first confirmation service the following May, the local newspaper re reported that Rabbi Levy preached the confirmation sermon, a clear, concise, and strong defense of liberty of conscience, and a touching appeal to the children to honor their parents, love and serve God, to prove loyal to the American principle, obedient to the laws, and steadfastly patriotic in their love for the flag of the nation, end quote. A couple of years later, the Sacramento labor community honored him as he was departing for Philadelphia. In his remarks, he said, the name of America stands not for the soil alone, but for the bright hope of the bright future when we shall all worship one common father as his children, end quote. 
Jay Leonard Levy was naturalized as a U.S. citizen in May of 1895. When he went to Palestine and Constantinople just after that, he wrote, very much moved on arriving at Jaffa by ship, I stood there as an American. Those of you who have ever used Rabbi Levy's Haggadah may remember that an American flag features prominently in it, which was certainly unusual, but again, a demonstration of his American patriotism. Though he was an educated, refined, and cultured Englishman, not exactly the stereotype of a typical immigrant to America, J. Leonard Levy also believed in and lived the immigrant ideal of America as a better place, a place where everyone could live up to their greatest potential. We are all the descendants of immigrants, and we are steeped in this American idea of possibility even today, even when we see its failures. Optimism and faith in the future were keynotes of Levy's belief system. This, I think, can be partly traced back to his education in London, where he was exposed to the modern thinkers of his age. One he quotes frequently and also devoted a whole lecture to in 1904 is Herbert Spencer, the social Darwinist who was also a favorite of Andrew Carnegie. Spencer coined the phrase, the survival of the fittest, which has certainly been used in a negative way, but which Levy interpreted as part of the constantly ascending arc of human possibilities. These two short quotes are from lectures Rabbi Levy gave in his first year at Knesset Israel in Philadelphia. Quote, others have placed the golden age in times past, evolution and Judaism located in the distant future. They both point to a gradual unfolding of the human family, a steady rising unto perfection, a development unto the ideal man. And again, quote, optimism is the very keynote, the tonic, if I may use a musical term, of our religion. Faith in man is its median. Love is the dominant feature. And charity is the octave that co completes the chord and produces at once harmony and melody, end quote. I don't think Levy was foolishly naive about the problems to be found in America in the Gilded Age. He preached several sermons about anti-Semitism, and many, many more calling attention to the plight of workers, immigrants, and poor people. But overall, his hallmark was optimism about this country and its possibilities, and he was determined that reform could make it the world that he wanted it to be. And now I want to circle back a little bit to the Spanish-American War. I said that Levy volunteered to be a chaplain, but you'll notice I didn't say he served in that capacity. I've checked his military records at the National Archives, and in fact, Keegan's brigade was never called up due to the short duration of the war. And while it's certainly theoretically possible for a person to want to serve as a chaplain in a war without advocating that war, to be there as a support for the soldiers who have to suffer the horrors of battle, that was not the case with Levy in that war. He was absolutely gung-ho on the war and on a U.S. victory. So in case you think I'm a Levy hero worshiper, I'm gonna read you more from one of his 1898 speeches, even though it makes me cringe to read these jingoistic words. Quote, the Anglo-Saxon race, which includes America and England, has been selected by destiny for a nobler purpose. That race has been born to rule the world. The time may come, it is to be hoped, when the stars and stripes and the Union Jack of old England may be interwoven, not for aggrandizement, but for humane development, not for war, but for peace, so that the time may be approximated when nation shall not lift up sword against nation and war shall be learned no more." End quote. I could go on, but this speech just gets worse. But though I haven't been able to home in on the exact turning point, shortly after the end of the war, Rabbi Levy became a convert to the sort of pacifism that was prevalent in that early 20th century peace movement with its emphasis on world courts and international arbitration as alternatives to war. And here, right in these statements of Anglo-American superiority, which sounds so awful to our 21st century race consciousness, is, I think, the key to his changed viewpoint. If you look at the leaders and the documents that came out of those early 20th century peace organizations, there's an undercurrent to many of them that the world must be made to see that the Anglo-American virtues and values they celebrated represent the pinnacle of human development and that anything anywhere else in the world is automatically inferior. 
We tend, I think, to assume that excessive nationalism is what gets countries into wars. But here it seems that nationalism and patriotism form the basis for a movement that sincerely sought to end wars by operating world courts based on English and American law, but without admitting the validity of any other systems. Once his conversion to pacifism had taken place, Jay Leonard Levy devoted to that cause huge amounts of his energy and dynamism, using his natural charisma to bring others in too. In 1905, he founded and became president of the Pittsburgh Peace Society, getting Andrew Carnegie to serve as honorary president. In his capacity as co-editor of the Jewish Criterion newspaper, he dedicated a whole issue in 1905 to articles about peace, and he preached many sermons and lectures on the subject of peace, both here at Rav Shalom and all over the country. On the national level, this list represents just some of the organizations Rabbi Levy belonged to and events he attended. Very few other rabbis were involved in these organizations, and there were, as far as I know, no specifically Jewish peace organizations. The two largest national peace organizations have been founded by Quakers, Unitarians, and other liberal Christian denominations, basing their work explicitly on the teachings of Jesus. In some groups, only quote unquote professing Christians were allowed to be members. But even though that changed over time, there was a certain element of tokenism in the participation of Rabbi Levy, Rabbi Stephen Wise, and the few other rabbis who identified as pacifists. When he was asked to give prayers or addresses at the national meetings of these groups, Levy bought into this to a certain extent by saying that he brought greetings from his people or that he came as a representative of his race. While he held few national level offices in those organizations, Levy was an enthusiastic speaker for them and an energetic participant in committee work during the years from 1904 until his death. Rabbi Levy wasn't shy about publicizing his pacifist views in creative ways. In 1905, he made a trip to Nuremberg, the center of German toy manufacture, to encourage factories to make peace toys instead. And he had ideas of what those toys should be. And at home, he offered a prize of $1,000 for the best new novel on a peace theme. Also in 1905, he traveled to Japan, hoping to be of some use in settling the Russo-Japanese War. The war was pretty much over by the time he got there, but he did have meetings with Japanese officials. And then he also attended the Second Hague Peace Convention in 1907. During the buildup to World War I and the years before the US entered the war, Levy continued to speak out ever more forcefully against war in general and this impending war in particular. His perspective was not that of, a, of an isolationist who thought that it should stay a European war but rather that of a pacifist who was willing to work to replace war with workable, effective institutions of peace. Shortly after the war broke out in Europe, Rabbi Levy delivered a series of three lectures called The War Against War. In the first, he said, quote, you know that I have for the past 12 years, in season and out of season, raised my voice against militarism. You know that I was the first man in our country to offer my services as a volunteer in 1898 in the American-Spanish War. Well, that's a little misleading, as we now know. And that since that was over, I have been an unfailing advocate of what is known as the pacifist policy. I am a converted man. I believe that today a better method of settling international difficulties than by wholesale murder has been devised, end quote. In the second of this series, he said, quote, I am a pleader for peace. I believe that it is the mission of my religion to urge the world to abolish war and to establish peace. I believe that I have no higher reason for remaining a Jew than to be before men a witness to the existence of the one and only God and in his name, help them to find the way that leads to equity and justice, end quote. And in the third, he talks about the heroism of peace and says, quote, I believe that there is more heroism in destroying germs than in killing Germans and more bravery in conquering parasites than in capturing Paris, end quote. Rabbi Levy continued to work tirelessly for the anti-war cause, and he seemed indefatigable in every way. But his energy for protesting the war 
and his essential life energy gave out at pretty much the same time. Levy's first sermon after the U.S. formally declared war on Germany in April 6, on April 6, 1917, was called A Time for War and a Time for Peace, with the familiar text from Ecclesiastes. His personal anguish is evident in the tone of his writing, but he urges the congregation and all Jews to support President Wilson and the war effort. Quote, whether we love peace and believe in unarmed peace, or whether we regard war as an anachronism or an inevitable necessity in such an age. Every man who loves America and every man who believes in the destiny of our country and every man, woman and child living under the aegis of the starry banner of the land will, now that the hour calls for service, place at the disposal of our nation, if the heart beats patriotically, their life, their sacred liberties, their possessions, end quote. As you see, he hasn't lost any of his American patriotism, even if the government's actions go against the very cause he has fought for for so long. He goes on to say, in all matters, we must be Americans first. In urging his congregants to support the war, he holds out the hope that the end of war will bring peace. He says, quote, this is a time of war because we are not organized for peace. I believe in peace. I regard wars as one of the survivals of the ages when men had not emerged from the brute stage. I pray with all my heart and soul that the day may not be far distant when men will be wise enough to organize for international peace on the basis of justice, as in times past and in the present they have organized for war. I believe that as a man. I believe that as a citizen of this great republic. I believe that as a Jew a humble follower of the great prophet Isaiah, whose eyes pierced the uncertain darkness and drew the outlines of the universal state of world peace, end quote. Two weeks later, at the end of his Sunday lecture, Levy appeared a bit shaky and had to hold on to the lectern to make himself steady. He went home to rest. He was very ill by Monday and died on Thursday, April 26 of pneumonia. We can't now know whether Rabbi Levy would have continued to put his great eloquence and unusual drive behind the cause of pacifism. And although some of Rabbi Levy's motivations for pacifism may seem suspect to us today, we cannot judge him entirely by the standards of our time. We have to recognize that in his time, the early 20th century, advocating for world peace required sticking one's neck out to try to convince others that constant war was not only non-productive, but was also immoral according to the standards of both Judaism and Christianity. I particularly like this quotation from a 1905 lecture because it expresses how the insidious tentacles of war permeate all levels of society. Quote, peace is a women's question because they suffer the most from war. An industrial question because the costs of war fall on all classes. A religious question because all religions condemn fratricide and a moral question, because might does not make right. Mankind needs to evolve past war. All disputes between nations need to be resolved by international courts and laws." End quote. Well, it's been impossible for me to put together the research for this talk without being acutely aware of the current tensions and ruptures in our country. Yesterday, we honored the label, labor of Martin Luther King Jr. and others in the civil rights movement whose work is nowhere near finished. And tonight we wait and watch a Capitol fortified by thousands of troops to ensure a peaceful transition of presidential power tomorrow. Looking back at history, it's easy to be cynical watching the same issues come up again generation after generation. Seeing wars take over the imagination of groups and nations that resort to violence in the certainty of their moral and military superiority over other groups and nations. But I also think it's possible for the study of history to give us a sense of hopefulness about the future, or perhaps I'm just by nature an optimist as I believe Rabbi Levy was. In the early 20th century, when he was active as a pacifist, there was no universal declaration of human rights, no United Nations, no International Court of Justice, no International Criminal Court, no International Tribune for the Law of the Sea, no Permanent Court of Arbitration. Though their powers may sometimes be honored only in the breach, still these exist 
These institutions exist now, and their purpose is to reduce the incidence of armed conflict in the world and increase the recognition of the human right of all of us to live safely and in dignity. Rabbi Levy's pacifist work more than 100 years ago helped to make possible these steps toward the peaceful world he envisioned and we all hope for. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, we're now going to have questions. Uh, there, the only question so far in the chat is the one that I put forth, um, which was to wonder what his peace toy ideas were. <laughs> uh, while we're having an answer, please, um, you can offer questions in the chat. We'll also allow people to come off of mute, um, you know, orderly <laughs> uh, to ask questions out loud as well. Well, he did have an idea of a board game and also um, a kind of a parade of vehicles instead of tanks and um, trucks with war material on them. He had uh, people from all nations sitting in these trucks in the form of a parade going around. I don't know, he tried. I mean, generation after generation, mothers and probably fathers too have tried to keep their kids from playing with war toys, but pretty hard to do. Bill asks, do you think Rabbi Levy's switch from Orthodox to reform impacted his view on pacifism? Well, that's a good question. Um, I, I think that certainly at that time and now to the, um, the openness of reform probably allows for more individual freedom of belief and freedom of expression. And that probably played a big part in it. Uh, this was really a very strong internal belief of his. And as I said, represented a real change from his earlier views. So, um, I think he found, you know, he had a pretty much a bully pulpit here. He was very, very popular. He could say what he wanted and do what he wanted. And largely that was because he was so dynamic that people just wanted to fall in line with him. His wife said in a, um, an oral history that was done with Hetty when she was 100 years old in 1965, so 50 years or more after he had died, um, she said, all he had to do was just ask them for money and they just started writing big checks. They just loved everything he did. And I mean, 50 years, she was a real J. Leonard Levy hero worshiper, I have to say, after 50 years. Some of the things in her oral history are a little bit suspect, but, um, but I think that was true, that he was just very powerful and people really wanted to do what he, they wanted to follow him in his strong convictions. So Martha, did anyone after his death pick up some of his causes locally? Um, not so much the peace causes. I'm pretty sure that that Pittsburgh Peace Society died a quiet death. And mm. by that time, <clears throat> um, Andrew Carnegie was in New York at that time. And he founded the Carnegie Endowment for Peace. And he put his attentions there rather than here in Pittsburgh because uh, you know, he, he wasn't here as much as he had been before. He's more in New York and in Scotland. Um, and I don't think that anybody picked that up. There, there was a, a prominent judge named Buffington and a couple of um, maybe presidents of Pitt and uh, not Carnegie Tech, but um, maybe just Pitt were officers in that Pittsburgh Peace Society, but I couldn't find anything about it after about 1907 or eight. Eleanor asks, the Pittsburgh platform of the reform movement was before his time, right? What did he think of it? Did that play a role in his coming to Pittsburgh and Red of Shalom? That's a good question. Uh, it was definitely before his time. He was 20 years old when it, um, was formulated and had never been to the United States. So I, I don't imagine he knew about it at that point. He was still Orthodox then. Um, and I've, I can't remember that I've seen any, anything that he wrote about it in a sermon or lecture or commented about it in the newspaper. I should look for that. Um, I imagine that it probably did play a role in his coming here because Rabbi Krauskopf, his boss in Philadelphia, 
was um, one of the people who attended the Pittsburgh Con Pittsburgh Platform Conference here. So um, I'm sure that it would have been a subject of conversation and it was kind of the, the prevailing document in Reform Judaism beginning in 1885. So he certainly would have known about it. Uh, Martha. Yes. Uh, Hi, uh, who's talking? Who's talking? I don't see. Anybody? Um, I saw Libby, you were, you were about to ask something, but you're muted now. Yeah. Um, can I talk? Oh, yes. sure. yeah. Okay. Uh, what I wanted to say was what happened to his family? Did they remain here in Pittsburgh? Are they still members? Their grandchildren, grandchildren, members of Brother Sholem? Uh, That's another good question. Um, his wife was a member here until her death. And she died, I think she was 104 when she died. So he died in 1917, and she was still here in the 60s. Um, she was active in sisterhood. She did a lot of handcrafts. She was a kind of folksy woman. Listening to this um, really interesting oral history of her, she just said, oh, I don't like any fuss and bother. Go talk to the young people. I don't have anything really important to say. I, I found her pretty interesting, though. Um, they had two daughters, uh, Ruth and Edna. And... Um, Let's see, they both stayed in Pittsburgh, um, but I don't believe there are any descendants living in Pittsburgh now. And I've heard that um, most of his descendants are not practicing Jews anymore. I don't know that for sure, but um, several people have told me that. I haven't verified that. <laughs> but I don't have any contact with him, and I don't know that anybody in the congregation does. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Jay Rogal, I see your microphone's unmuted. Did you have a question? No. Nope. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Ruth Yar asks um, that uh, since Rabbi Levy seemed to have given speeches in so many places and traveling so much, uh, when did he have time to do his job at Road Up Shalom? That's a really good question. It is amazing how pe how much people in those times traveled. Uh, they just didn't think anything of it. He was away a lot. And now, for one thing, rabbis at that time in Rodop Shalom had the summers off. So he did a lot of that other work during the summers. Um, that's important to know. I told that to Rabbi Bisno once, and he said, yeah, that sounds nice. <laughs> So maybe it'll come back as a tradition, but I doubt it because the work of um, running a congregation was quite a bit different then. I think um, there was much less of the administrative part that a rabbi had to do. And um, so he was free, but he did negotiate that with the congregation. There were a couple, the congregation was pretty proud that he was such an important person in Reform Judaism and that he was known all over the country. I mean, he I've looked him up in newspapers and he's reported in newspapers all over the country, very small newspapers sometimes that pick up an article from a new service and report on a whole lecture that he gave in some big town somewhere as if it were really hot news. It's really interesting to me. But uh, I think there were times that some leaders of the congregation felt that he was doing too much outside work. And one of those times was in around 1912, 1913. He became probably the most important fundraiser for the synagogue and school extension, which was um, a branch of the UAHC that, that sponsored religious schools everywhere. He did an enormous amount of fundraising for that, and that required a lot of travel. And some leaders in the congregation here thought it was, it was cutting into his work. I think there was some ambivalence about it. And, and also, uh, he had the reputation for being incredibly healthy. I talked about this once before fairly recently. Um, I've done a little research on that. And he wasn't nearly as healthy as he seemed to be. He seemed very vigorous. But he did a couple of times have attacks of bad health, cause not given in any place that I could see, that laid him low for sometimes a month at a time, three or four times in his life. 
And some of those happened during the summer. He was just able to rest up. Um, other times he just had to stop everything. And there are places in the newspaper where I've seen notices Rabbi Levy was supposed to talk in um, Newcastle and that talk has been canceled because of his illness, something like that. Um, so I think that there were some stresses within the congregation, but also a lot of pride that this was such an incredibly eloquent speaker. And you, I have been reading a lot of his lectures. They are really quite amazing. They're full of literary and classical allusions, lots of knowledge of history, but many of them, and I hope the excerpts that I've read to you tonight will show you this, many of them are just spoken from the heart and really absolutely beautiful preaching, very dynamic, very eloquent, very erudite, but not showing that off. I, I find him really wonderful to read, and I'm sure listening to him would have been even more so. On the subject of all of those lectures and sermons, um, we have a question of where they could be accessed. Where's a really good place to start in order to find and read some of those? Well, the best place to start is at the archives of Road of Shalom Congregation, because that's where we have, um, we have pretty much a complete run of the lectures that were published during the time that he worked at Road of Shalom. I also have a lot from his years at um, Knesset Israel, not a complete set of those, but quite a number. Um, they're not available online, but if you're interested, please contact me. It's just berg, B-E-R-G, at roadofshalom.org. And I can scan, you know, I can give you an idea of some subject matter, or you can ask me if you're interested in particular subject matter. I can scan some and send them to you. That's probably the best way. And I put the, uh, I put Martha Berg's email in the chat as well, so you can copy and paste oh, um, Bill is wondering about congregational tensions. What tensions did Rabbi Levy's pacifism um, bring out in the congregation? You know, I, I haven't read of any negative response. Um, that doesn't mean there isn't any. And that's, again, I really wish that we had his correspondence. If, if I had his correspondence in the archives, I would be a happy archivist, really. It would be wonderful to see how he how congregants responded to things he said in his sermons and lectures, um, how those manufacturers responded when he said, you know, you need to pay people a living wage. You know, that was pretty radical for someone to tell some of the big wigs in American industry at that time. And there may have been people who um, were very interested in getting the US into World War I. I imagine that there were because um, the Pittsburgh industrial base had a lot to do with munitions at that time. So um, that would have been a conflict possibly, but I don't have any evidence of it. I haven't seen anything in newspapers. Um, there was a time when Wilson came here in 1916 and gave a big speech on preparedness. And I think that was extremely well supported by the Pittsburgh industrial community. And at that occasion, Rabbi Levy was among about a hundred people that the newspaper listed who were invited to sit um, on the stage with the president. But it doesn't say anything about any, you know, anybody speaking against preparedness. And I don't know that there were any big rallies against preparedness in Pittsburgh as there were in some other cities. I haven't seen any evidence of that either. Bill asks, uh, did Rabbi Levy integrate any Hebrew into his lectures? Ooh, only a couple of words here and there. I mean, this was at the time of classical reform in Rav Shalom, and there was very little Hebrew anywhere. I mean, he certainly was cognizant of Hebrew and, and fluent and all of that and knew all the prayers and all the history and all of that. But um, I think that it appeared very little in the congregational life and services at that time. And we also have a question from Joel and Goldie. Did Rabbi Levy have an assistant rabbi? Was that even heard of at the time? He did not have an assistant rabbi. The whole time he was here, he did not have an assistant rabbi. That it really didn't get started here until a bit later. Although, let's see, I think there was, oh, I can't remember really. I think there was one assistant rabbi named Greenfield who was here before Rabbi Levy was here who was the assistant to Rabbi Lippmann Mayer, 
Um, and partly that was a question of language because Dr. Mayer did not speak very good English and um, he was much more comfortable in German. So an assistant fulfilled that role of the English speaker um, during that time. It was a very short time though. Those are the questions I'm seeing in the chat. If I've missed any, feel free to drop them again or um, unmute and ask. Um, Nancy uh, asks, what was the size of Rodef Shalom during his time? Well, when he first got here, it shot up to over 300 families within the first year. And then, um, was up, up, I think, about a thousand families by the time um, of his death. Maybe more than that. I'm not sure about that. Somewhere I, I compiled some statistics of the annual membership because I don't think that had been done for a long time. And I just looked back through old board minutes and annual reports. Um, but I'm not positive about the numbers. But email me if you want to know that and I can dig that up for you. Rabbi Friedman, uh, Friedman offers a question that I think I might get a little, I might not be able to articulate this properly. Um, <laughs> wondering if uh, Rabbi Levy in his um, application to serve as a military chaplain was an, was he an officer or simply attached to a unit because the formal mechanism uh, for the Jewish community to provide rabbis did not start until 1917. That's right. He was, a, he was attached to a volunteer brigade, which, as I said, never really got mustered in, so never saw service. It was a very informal thing. And the leader of that brigade, a Colonel Keegan, uh, wrote a letter to Rabbi Levy inviting him to be the chaplain. And um, Levy then said he would love to do that, but he would need to get permission from his congregation. He asked Knesset Israel if he could do that. And they said, absolutely. And not only can you do it, but we'll hold your place for you and we will pay you your regular salary all the time that you were serving as a chaplain. But you're right that the, um, the institution of Jewish chaplains was not part of the uh, American military at that time at all. It developed later. Rabbi Henry asks, uh, what may be our last question this evening, did you talk about his commitment to paying for the sanctuary uh, before dedicating it? No, I didn't talk about that, um, but that's absolutely true. He, uh, the, the building of the sanctuary overran its budget by about $100,000, and um, people couldn't come up with the money, and he, they wanted to dedicate it right away, 1907, those first services were high holy day services that fall. He said, no way, that's not happening. You do not give a gift to God that's not paid for. It's just not happening while I'm here. So um, they were working on it little by little. And let's see, there was a board meeting, I think it was on the Monday. He started getting sick on Sunday. This was in April, 1917. On Monday, there was a board meeting scheduled Monday or Tuesday. And at that board meeting, they were going to, they had invited Rabbi Levy to come to the board meeting and they were going to tell him at that time that they, the, the leaders of the board had gathered the money that was necessary to pay off the rest of the debt. And this was um, 10 years after the, the building had been built and was in full use, but it just hadn't been dedicated. So um, he was already too sick to come to a meeting by then. So they sent a an officer to tell him at his bedside. So he died a happy man and they dedicated the sanctuary at his funeral. Martha, it's Sharon, I asked the question. I, I'll, I'll turn my video on. Um, did, they, did they do the, the funeral in the sanctuary then and do the funeral yeah. and dedicate it at the same time? They did the funeral in the sanctuary. Rabbi Levy had absolutely insisted that there be no eulogies. And, you know, it's pretty hard to do a funeral without a eulogy, right? You probably know a lot more about that than I will ever know. Um, 
So Rabbi Stephen Wise, who was another very famous reform rabbi at the time, was asked to come in and give the main address. And he, I, I believe he said in that address, it was pretty hard not to give, not to eulogize Rabbi Levy. Um, but they did do it as a dedication. All of this, I've read some of the speeches. The, the place was, there were way too many people. There were, there were reputed to be five to 10,000 people standing in the street outside on the day of his funeral, who couldn't get into the sanctuary. And um, the speakers who did speak all, you know, it was all but eulogy, obviously. Well, what um, we usually say is something along the lines of, we're not supposed to give a eulogy, but if we were going to, we would say, <laughs> and then we say whatever. It was very much like that, very much like that. But he had insisted on that. In fact, I, I think that his, um, the first kind of, last wishes that he expressed were in a letter that he left with his wife when he went to Europe um, in the early part of his time at Rome Shalom. And in that, I mean, there, there wasn't really any expectation that he was going to die. It was just one of those things like, I'm going far away, you're not coming with me. If anything happens to me, this is what I want. And at that time, even he said, I don't want anything fancy on my on the occasion of my death. I want um, just everything simple, no eulogy, no nothing. So. Well, thank you so much, Martha. It's been just a wonderful evening, and uh, and you you wove all this into this you know the events of this week so masterfully. Uh, we really can't uh, can't extend uh, our appreciation as much. Uh, and uh, thank you all all those out there for joining us this evening, and uh, we'll hope forward to seeing you next month at our uh, upcoming presentation. Thank you, Martha. Thank you. Thanks, Martha. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thanks, Martha. See you, Bill. Thanks, Martha. Thank, Thank you, Martha. See you, Peter, John. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Martha. Thank you. You're welcome.